Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our June uh, governance uh, webinar. Uh, today's topic, as you probably are well aware, is the work of our Division Three Athletic Trading Working Group. Uh, my name is Bill Regan, and I am joined by one of the working group members, Rick Burr. Rick is Director of Athletic Performance at Babson University. I am the Managing Director for Division Three. Today, what we hope to do is to give you an idea of who the working group is, um, what the working group has been asked to do, their charge, um, the information that the working group has used to start really formulating many of its recommendations, uh, give you an oversight of those recommendations and kind of give you a time frame of what is coming up. Before I jump to the next slide, I do want to go over a couple of logistical pieces. Uh, there is this PowerPoint that you're uh, actually seeing now will be a, is available on the Division Three webinars page on NCA.org. Um, by the end of the week, we'll also have a recording uh, of this webinar that will also be available uh, where you would find the PowerPoint. And to ask questions, we'd ask that you use the Q&A function that's at the top of the screen. What we're going to try to do is save the questions till the end of my section. And then we'll have another opportunity at the very end for you to answer, to ask any questions you may have. Um, and given the timing, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And if we can't get to everything, what we'll do is commit to be able to follow up via email with whoever has an outstanding question. So with that, Katie, if you may advance to the next slide. So who are the working group members? There are 13 members total. Uh, over the next few slides, you'll see who they are. Uh, the composition of those working group members, there are five athletic trainers from our Division Three institutions. There are two presidents. Felt it was really important to have a presidential presence on this because a lot of these recommendations are going to have to end up on your president's desk. And we also have six athletic administrators from Division Three institutions. I will say many of those are former athletic trainers. Uh, of that 13, those 13 individuals, uh, there's a representative from both our presidents, uh, Mary Beth, uh, Steve Morrow and I from our management council, uh, Mary Beth Lamb. So we want to ensure there was a tie to the, the two highest councils within the membership. So Katie, if you can go to the next slide. And you can see what is the charge of the working group? Well, the working group was formed really based on some concerns that were raised by athletic administrators in Division Three, and just the struggles they were having with retaining and actually hiring athletic trainers. So the working group was created by the Division Three Management Council to really look at what are the factors um, that are impacting Division Three institutions specifically uh, in their ability to both retain and hire athletic trainers. Um, Katie, if you could move on. So I think. And a critical component of the work of the, the group was to base their decisions and recommendations on data and really to avoid the kind of using anecdotal information, although important, helps to structure and formulate some of their conversations. They really wanted to say, what does the data show us? What does survey information show us? And that is, you can see a, a summary of some of those uh, data sets that the working group has been using. Uh, the first was there was a meeting, a joint meeting. There's a type one. This slide was actually in June of 2023. And there was a joint meeting between groups of the NATA, the, Na the National Athletic Trainers Association, as well as individuals from our Sports Science Institute and three individuals from each of the three divisions, one, two, and three, attended a, a stakeholder meeting in June and really had a really frank discussion about the current state of athletic trainers, uh, the pipeline for athletic trainers, the educational model for athletic trainers, and, and just some of their findings and had a really just great discussion about that. So the information from that meeting uh, was available for the working group as well as a, a white paper that the working group, the uh, NATA put out. So they had a chance to review the white paper as well as all some of the supporting survey and survey information and data from that helped supported and was used to draft that white paper. They've also the, the working group has actually looked at a couple NATA uh, surveys relative to uh, compensation that they've conducted over the last several years. And then in the fall of 23, the working group felt it was really important to kind of get the voice of Division Three. 
um, and to hear that voice and to hear some of the issues that Division Three institutions specifically are dealing with. So they sent a survey out to both our Division Three athletic trainers and Division Three directors of athletics. They have used that information to help set up its conversation for the 24 issues form that was conducted at the convention. So we've used that feedback as well as all the other information really for the working group to begin to start to construct its particular recommendations and its discussions over this almost past year. Katie, if you turn to the next slide. So at this point, what I'll do is turn it over to Rick. Well, I'll stop first, see if there's any questions about any of the background information. Katie, is there anything in the Q&A? There is not. OK, at this point, I'll turn over to Rick Burt really to talk about what is the working group working on? Bill, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. So after reviewing the literature and examining the surveys, the working group identified three areas of focus. Culture and communication, workload and work life balance. Next slide. In addition to these, other areas will be addressed in the final recommendations. These will include compensation. Now understand this was beyond salaries, even though we understand the salaries are a concern. Institutions need to look at other ways to be able to compensate athletic trainers by paying for dues or memberships, as well as for continued education. Another area we, we addressed was the current educational model. There's been a lot of concern that the new advancements of the athletic training into the master's models, and some individuals still think the answer is to go back to the old ways. Well, unfortunately, that is not gonna happen. Institutions have to understand that this is the way of the future, and there really is no turning back. And we're also gonna look at potential recommendations for financial support from the NCA. Here, the working group will look at support for the institution's health and safety initiatives. Finding ways institutions can offset the funding. The working group will look to, to recommend that the NCA provide funds to membership institutions to help them offset expenses related to student athlete health and safety. This would include paying for athletic trainers professional development and licensure requirement. The funds could also be used to help pay for first aid and CPR training as well as for AEDs. In addition, the funds can be used to help support mental health and electronic medical records. Supporting the pipeline. So this was the working group will look at the possibility of expanding existing programs that the D3 institutions can use to help hire positions that include athletic trainers. Next slide. The working group understood that Division three institutions vary throughout the country, and our recommendations are intended to provide institutions with a variety of ways to address each area of focus. We understand that there is no one correct way, but we want to be able to give them the ability to choose different avenues. Since 2020, there has been a lot of change. For the professional athlete, profession of athletic trainers, working in the intercollegiate athletics is not the only options. We are seeing more and more athletic trainers working in the corporate field, physicians' offices, and a growing number working in the high school settings. The particular workforce itself has changed. The workforce has never been as varied as it is today. There's a higher expectation for the workplace by the employees. Institutions need to make a better effort at attracting and engaging with this changing workforce and to minimize the risk of losing their workers and the process of the opportunity of both. Institutions need to think outside the box and to find ways to address the issues. And the hope is that through our recommendations, we can help them do that. So let's take a deeper dive into these three areas of focus. The first one, culture and communication. The recommendation from the working group was that changes needed to be made within the institutions. One of the primary changes was that institutions need to enhance the athletic trainer's voice. Interestingly, during COVID, one of the first people that most institutions leaned upon was the athletic trainer to help them through this crisis. But in a lot of ways, institutions have moved away from that. Athletic trainers have a strong voice and they need to be part of the senior leadership team. They also need to be able to have the appropriate job title that is in sync 
with the other members of the senior leadership team. The athletic trainers can have a direct impact on policy and legislative decisions that directly impact how the athletic training staff is able to function. The working group also felt that the leadership of the athletic trainer can set what the expectations are of when and how staff, coaches, and student athletes interact with their athletic training staff. One of the areas that was seen throughout the surveys was the effect of workload on the current staffing model of the athletic trainers. Institutions have increased their squad sizes, but have not given the appropriate resources to be able to effectively manage those increases. Some suggestions from the working group was to look at the balance of care versus coverage. Institutions can look at ways that they cover, cover out of season activities and understand the impact of athletic trainers traveling with teams. A common theme was seen that athletic trainers felt that they could not take days off. And if they were not under contract during the summer, that there was still expectations of them to continue to do their work. The working group felt that institutions need to have a better understanding of what is required of their athletic trainers. There was also a recognition of understanding the current landscape that is impacting healthcare professionals. These are not limited to, but include immediate accessibility of healthcare professionals and long hours. Other ways to combat these issues would be to limit athletic training hours and when it is necessary to have in-person coverage. The final area, final, excuse me, the final area of work-life balance, as mentioned before, the dynamics of the workforce today has a greater emphasis on work-life balance. So institutions need to have a better understanding how to be able to assist and create an environment that emphasizes work-life balance. The working group put together some possible recommendations. <clears throat> and again, the hope was not that all of these recommendations would be achieved, but that they would be able to implement some of these recommendations. First, to look at the schedule, to set a fixed treatment time as opposed to walk-in hours. And as I mentioned before, to value and respect when individuals need time off. To look at alternative staffing models. Some of these might be as simple as having some staff work the morning shift, others to work afternoon shifts, as well as varying coverage of specific athletic trainers for specific sports. Institutions need to set expectations of when athletic, athletes and staff communicate with their athletic trainers. What we've seen time and time again is that the expectation is that if someone texts as a member of the athletic training staff, no matter the time of day or night, that there is supposed to be an instant reply. And this is not a realistic way to operate. Another area that came up was the communication of when practice times are changed. In a lot of cases in the survey, these changes were made either unknowingly to the athletic training staff or occurred with less than 24 hours notice. This does not set a culture that respects the needs of the athletic training staff. The working group felt that it was important that institutions set the parameters of when practices can be changed. And finally, to encourage more first aid and CPR training, not only of head coaches, but to assistant coaches, to be able to assist in situations when it is not necessary to have the athletic training staff there, but to make sure that the health and safety of the athletes is addressed. So timeline that we're looking at right now is that as we came out of April, we had the additional recommendations reviewed by the presidents of division three and the management council. Recently, we re revised the recommendations and re it was reviewed by the NCA committee on, commi on committee safeguards and medical aspect of sports. July, the recommendations are gonna be presented to the different councils and until August. And the hope is that by February, we're gonna have the final recommendations uh, available to the membership. So at this time, if there's any questions, concerns of where we've come from, uh, we can 
try to go into those. Katie and Bill. Rick, Bill, there are no questions yet, but as a reminder, please use the Q&A function. I know you can raise your hand, but unfortunately there is no way for you to turn on your mic or your camera or ask it in the chat. So you will need to use the Q&A function for those of you who've raised your hands. Just a little speech bubble with a question mark at the top of your screen. Yeah, just maybe just one clarification. I think Rick said, I just want to make sure on the timeline. I think the hope is that this work group would conclude its work by the fall uh, and be able to get a final set of published recommendations for the membership that have been endorsed by both councils. So we think it's important. I think the working group feels it's really important to have that as you go into the academic year to have that information. So I believe that is the hope, but to use the council as the, the summer council meeting is a, is a final sign off for any set of recommendations moving forward. That's a great segue because the first question we got was, did you say final recommendations in the fall? So yes, final recommendations, you can see there on the timeline that's pulled up and as Bill just stated. Um, next question. When addressing work-life balance and culture, isn't the membership adopting counterintuitive legislation by adopting 114, which has increased the pressures on ATCs, SID, and facilities? Has the group looked at changing legislation to truly address legislation or making real recommendations on ATC staffing levels so we can advocate with president to increase staffing and salaries? Do you want to give it a first go and then I can come in after? Okay. So um, this, it's a great question. And it's, we've looked at the two areas there of, we looked at ratios and the concern we have right now is that because each of these institutions are so varied and it's, it, we, we wanna be able to put recommendations that are gonna be able to be put into place. And we have to be realistic about that. Um, it is an area that I've heard major concern from uh, other constituents about making sure that we can be able to do this. Um, I think the, the deeper dive is to make sure that institutions understand what's happening there and they need to start to make those considerations as, a mo as opposed to saying, These, this is what you need to do and you need to do it immediately. So it needs to be over a period of time. Yeah, and I would add a couple of things. I think this is where Rick talked about the care versus coverage. How do you manage based on current legislation? Working group is not recommending any current legislative change, but we think an important part of uh, of the role of the ethic trainer is to and sports information director and other people to speak into future legislation, policy decisions, even how you manage the out of season or non-traditional season on your campuses that, you know, involving those other voices in, in that particular place is really important. So Shrek said it's how do you manage well based on our current structure, but also how do you include the athletic training voice on future legislative or policy decisions? And certainly one of the things the working group is recommending is that both at the institutional and at the conference level that there would be a greater intentionality in seeking out that particular voice as those things are being considered in the future. All right, next question we've got. There was no discussion on compensation with athletic trainers having a higher level of degree needed in those primary recommendations. Can you explain why that is? I think it's it's an understanding that this is what it is right now, that um, indirectly, we are addressing it. That athletic trainers, it's a master's level right now. Uh, this needs to be obviously, there's been um, information that's, that's been presented about the salaries, where they need to, to be at, uh, particularly with this master's level. Uh, but indirectly, we, we are addressing it. Okay, next one. Is there any plan to work with NATA to promote working in collegiate athletics? Yeah, Katie, I will talk to this. We will, part of the reason is go to CSMAS is to try to continue to have this work. The working group has started to continue to move forward at the national level. 
and for this to continue to be a topic of conversation for uh, our Sports Science Institute as well as CSMAS as they continue to look at this and that relationship with the NATA. So what possibly could be something that they would be looking into as we move, move forward. But these recommendations were really specific for Division Three, really to begin to affect what's going on right now. Thank you. And the questions are coming in quick. So next one we've got, is there any impetus to create a guidelines for athletic trainer staffing? For example, number of athletes per AT or number of sports per AT? Again, it's an area that we're looking at. Um, it's just a fine line to be able to, to work with a, a variety of institutions that to be able to make sure that everybody's going to fall in line with it. So we just don't want to be something where, you know, we set the guidelines and then people just aren't going to follow it. It's you want to make sure that this is something that's it's a reasonable request. Yeah, and I think Rick hit it on the head. And I think the other thing is people are looking for and ask for specific ratios. That is not going to come out of the working group. But what they will come out with potentially are how do you what are the factors that any institution should use when it comes to evaluating the number of athletic trainers or healthcare professionals that is currently using to address the health and safety of its student athletes? All right, our next one. Um, I think it was one of your first slides, Rick. You talked about potential financial support from the NCAA, such as grants, things like that. Can you explain a little bit more what that might look like? So presently we are we're looking at that. So we're looking at the diversity grant for one. Uh, there are other opportunities, but again, some of this we we're still in the uh, the early stages of it. Um, I will tell you that some of these came up probably within our last two meetings, Bill, that we've kind of started to really divulge in, divulge in dive into it rather. Um, so uh, we're, we're trying to explore every avenue to be able to do to help individuals um, use those NCA grants to be able to, to you know, start the process of increasing their staffing. Yeah, I just, I think Rick did a nice job of explaining that. I would say there's two primary buckets that the group has talked about is how do you use existing grants uh, that are used to support positions currently within Division Three, and can those be expanded or to include athletic trainers? The other part is, is there an opportunity to have specific money allocated to help offset some of these other expenses that Rick talked about earlier? Uh, those ones that are more health and safety related to offsetting uh, professional development of athletic trainers or the other health and safety initiatives really to say at the institutional level to make, is there a potential to make some of those dollars available? Thank you. The next one, um, an institution has implemented many of the recommendations in here, such as communication, limits, CPR training, et cetera. Um, but when they have an open position, they're not getting any candidates to apply. Do you have any, has the committee uh, or the working group had any recommendations to address immediate shortages? Uh, what should you, a department do or consider if they have no trainers available going into a season? A lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, obviously, there's challenges where we're facing the same thing as our institution of trying to find candidates. Um, Part of it is, again, making sure that they're adequately paid, which is a, which is again, institutional level that you have to kind of deal with. And it's something that you've got to work within your, either your department or work with your HR as far as how that goes with it. Um, so it's, it's individualized, but it's, you've got to be uh, proactive as far as trying to, to work with them and trying to get to a point. So, I mean, Unfortunately, I still see jobs posting for, you know, low 40s, which is it, it's 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 unbelievable that that's still out there. But I that institution, that's probably all they can be able to do at this point in time. But they need to work with it. The second part you you mentioned is saying if you don't get if you're unable to fill positions, which a lot of institutions have over the past couple of years, uh, we were in the same situation ourselves a couple of years ago. Uh, we had to make changes. We made significant changes. Kind of some of the recommendations here that came out of it was, uh, do we travel with teams? Um, you know, yes, we'd like to, but again, using other institutions that our teams are traveling to, that we made sure that, you know, that they were adequate, our athletes were adequately taken care of, but it was unfortunate we couldn't be able to do it. We couldn't be everywhere. Um, 
again, using some of the other recommendations, you got to kind of limit times, you've got to work with it and, and really kind of look at where is it more importantly that you staff your athletic trainers at um, if you do come to that situation. Uh, it, it, there are going to be some hard choices, but these are choices that need to be addressed within your institution as far as what are the pros and cons of what needs to be done. Great. Um, oh, Bill, do you have something else to add? Nope. Um, next question. Has there been any thought of having more athletic training representation on CSMAS or the Committee on Competitive Safeguards and Medical Aspects of Sport? Uh, in, during the working group conversations, that has not come up. Uh, certainly is in their upcoming meeting, the CSMS will review this recommendations and um, we'll see if that is a topic that they bring up during their conversations. Great, and next one, um, in regards to scaling back coverage, how could this affect those of us who have signed the Arrington v. NCAA in 2020 and the requirements within that settlement? Or are there of you familiar? Yeah, I think that's one we'll have to get back to someone, Katie, so if we can understand who sent that, we can certainly respond with a more complete email. Yes, if you have a, if you, whoever sent that, it was an anonymous user, but if you send, want to email that to me, I can forward that on to them. It is kmucci at nca.org. Um, I think we have a couple more about salary that you all have already answered that probably came in at the same time, as well as number of trainers and sports. There we go. A suggestion from someone for the critical items such as compensation ratios, standby coverage, et cetera, that exists beyond the scope of this working group. It might be helpful to create a bullet point list of questions that they would share with applicants or institutions could share with applicants or candidates to ask when applying for openings. Um, so just a suggestion from the, the Q&A. Good point. One more. I understand the recommendations for changes and focus on salary. However, even some PT clinics in our area and ortho offices in our area who have outstanding salaries and benefits for athletic trainers are unable to get candidates. Any thoughts from the group if there is just an overall decrease in certified ATs coming out each year? Based on the information that we have gone through this whole thing, there is there is not. There's the number is there. I think it's there are more opportunities um, for athletic trainers right now, tremendous more opportunities than, than ever before. Um, and there's just the people have choices now that before they didn't. So uh, it's it's it is it's a challenge for everybody. Um, it is something that hopefully we get the information out to the educational institutions and we get more and more students. So we're overpopulating. Um, I think right now we're pretty much staying at the same levels that we've had in the past. We just right now we need to we need to produce more and more. I think we have gotten just about every question that didn't look like a repeat to me. So with that being said, as Bill mentioned earlier, the recording will be available by the, available on the NCA.org webinars page by the end of this week. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, everybody. Rick, thank you. Thanks, Bill.